This week we're building one of the biggest dining tables that we've ever made, and everybody said the design was a bad idea, but we did it anyway. Believe it or not, I've been woodworking for about 10 years now, and this is actually the first time that I've ever built or worked with large slabs like the ones we're using for this table. Now, Sean, on the other hand, who's been woodworking for about the same amount of time, has built one other slab table, but it was only about six feet long. So six feet for my friends in the rest of the world is roughly about two kilometers. Now it's like 180 centimeters. Anyway, I'm not saying that to size shame his old slab or anything like that. The point that I'm getting at is we're both pretty green when it comes to this. So in hindsight, maybe it would have been smart to play it safe for this one. But as you're going to see, we didn't. And that might come back to bite us. Can't wait to see these things in the back of the ridge line. I know. Yeah. How long were they? All right. So in some of the shots you've seen here, we're at Street Tree Revival in Anaheim, California. And this fellow here is Little John, whose nickname is definitely ironic. And he gave us a great, probably about 45 minute tour that was like a finals cram session in all things slabs. You guys ready to take on the blue gum you can't lift this? It's a chunk of wood. This is special on this is red gum eucalyptus burl, eucalyptus camagulensis, botanicals platinus, platinus racemosa, platinus hybridica, and platinus mexicana. Average city in California has over 230 different species. And this is from Southeast Asia originally. No way. It's a chocolate alternative. Any guesses? Vanilla. So we really were like a couple of kids in a candy store here. We didn't know what to pick out. And honestly, I would have been happy with almost anything. But I will say that throughout the tour, for whatever reason, we kept gravitating back to this pair of elm slabs. So after a bit of talking, we made our final decision. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you yeah, too. hopefully we'll, we'll be back. Yeah. yeah, we'll Fantastic see. We'll see more. Yeah. <laughs> right on, man. <laughs> Almost got it. it was a good With the rough slabs back in the shop, the first thing that we actually did was lean them up on the wall and take pictures of them, and that was so that we could throw them in Photoshop, cut them out, and play with their final orientation. So with slabs like these, the way that I see it, they fall into three positions. First, you've got your argument position. Next, you've got your spooning position. And finally, you've got, um, I'll let you name this one. Anyway, we thought that the argument and spooning positions would make for bad dining tables. So we're going to go with this one. The first actual work that we did on the slabs was spending a couple of hours completely going over every nook, cranny, and crack in each of the slabs and basically just picking at them with an awl and some old chisels. And here the main thing that we're trying to prevent was a situation where any loose bits float to the surface when we pour our epoxy. So basically if it was loose enough to be able to pick out with just chisel hand strength, it came out. But if it was attached enough that you would need a hammer and a chisel to get it out, it could stay. Now the reason that we're being so diligent here is that I have no idea where this table is going to end up. I only know that it's not going to be at my house or Sean's house because honestly a 10 foot table is just too big for our dining rooms. So the last thing that we would want is for us to be in California and this table to be at somebody's house in New Hampshire or New York or worse, maybe New Zealand and for something to fail. So if you or someone you know wants to buy this table and has a house bigger than ours, I'm going to set up a web page with some pictures and information and you or they can get in touch with us there. At this point, our cracks were looking nice and clean. That doesn't sound right. At this point, the cracks in our slabs were looking nice and clean. So we started prepping for an epoxy pour. And the way we're using epoxy here is more for the utility of it than the looks of it. Pretty much we're wanting to fill in and stabilize all of these large cracks. So what we're mixing here is Fathom Thick Set from Total Boat. And this stuff is designed to be able to pour up to three inches thick, which is great since even though some of the cracks go all the way through our slabs, the slabs themselves are only about two and a half inches thick. Unfortunately, I don't think that the tape was designed to hold three inch deep pools of epoxy. So this happened when we tried to pour full depth. Thankfully, we were able to capture most of what was spilling out. And we learned our lesson from this first crack. And everywhere else, we just put a really thin layer that the tape could support. Figuring once it hardens, it'll create a barrier to support a full depth pour. I guess the silver lining was that cleaning up the epoxy sawdust gunk with a putty knife is kind of fun. Not like riding a roller coaster fun, but maybe more pick limp from your belly button fun. One of the things that really surprised me with pouring epoxy into slabs 
is how what might look like a single crack on the surface actually branches off into all sorts of little hallways within the slab. And because of that, it just keeps drinking it up. That said, thankfully, with this pour, there were no major issues. We did have one little leak, which you can see us panicking to fix here by clamping a piece of plywood onto it, which in the heat of the moment turned out to be a decent quick solution. Here we're flipping the tables back over and getting our first glimpse at what will eventually be the tops. And peeling the tape was kind of like unwrapping gifts on Christmas morning. If for Christmas your parents got you dried epoxy. All that said, things were looking pretty good aside from the plywood that we had glued onto our slabs, which almost broke my wrist trying to hit off. Well, I'm gonna break my wrist. <laughs> so instead we used a bunch of shims to pry it off and that took care of most of it. And then what was left, we thought we were gonna have to remove by sanding. But then I remembered that I had this power hand plane that's been sitting in a box for about two years, and this was finally its time to shine. So after cleaning everything up, we could get the few little spots where epoxy didn't completely get to the bottom of the slab, and we could fill up the few cracks that were only in the top side. And this was our last pour, or so we thought. Because the next morning when I came in, I discovered this little puddle, which had made its way from a tiny crack at the center of the slab all the way to the edge. I honestly don't even know how it's possible. It's like there's a portal inside of the slab or something. This was the first part of the project that I was a little nervous about. And that's not to say that things can't go wrong when you're pouring epoxy. I think we've proven that. But there isn't really any artistic decisions to be made with anything that we've done so far. And that is because it's all additive. You add epoxy, if something goes wrong, you add more, and you can't really add too much. With bark, on the other hand, while you still can't add too much of it, you can remove too much of it. And once you do, it's gone, and there's no getting it bark. Back. Sorry. So in these shots, I'm definitely using a light touch and really just getting rid of anything that's loosely connected, including my sandpaper. And the reason that we're doing this and sanding away the extra epoxy is because next we could load these guys back into the ridgeline and take them to get flattened on a wide belt sander. And on that note, I should actually thank all of you for helping me to find this place. So I had posted on Instagram a couple weeks back looking for some suggestions on finding a local place with a wide belt sander and a few of you recommended orangecountydrumsanding.com, which turned out to be the website for a place called RW Construction. And the good news was, they had a wide belt sander. The bad news was, it burned down. Not just the sander, but the whole place, I think. But the person that I spoke to there recommended another place called Dovetail Cabinets. So from your suggestion, in the end, we were able to find a solution, and they did a great job. And we were even able to talk them into joining MakerBook IO. So if anybody else in Southern California is ever looking, there you go. All right, so now we're back at the shop and I forgot to film us unloading the slabs. So this is just that same shot of us loading the slabs only in reverse, which makes Sean look a lot more like a jerk than he actually is and makes my hands look a lot stickier. And this is where it became decision times in terms of how to handle the edges. So there were a few spots where we didn't really have any choice but to be aggressive. Most notably this bulge, not lump thing here, which just would have looked really funky if we left it. And this other spot that had damage from maybe a strap or something. Everywhere else though, we tried to find a good balance between making it clean and consistent looking along the entire edge, but not so much so that it loses its natural look. And I was pretty happy with the outcome. On the inside edges of the slab, we have this area in the middle with some pretty aggressive, I don't know, whatever nature's version of a chamfer is. And as you can see, it gets really thin and fragile at the tips. So there we had to sand it back quite a bit just to make it more robust. And again, I was pretty happy with the way that it came out. I think we took care of the fragility, but it still definitely looks more natural than it does machined. And just because by this point we were feeling nostalgic for old times, we decided to do a little bit more epoxying. All right, let's talk about the base. So from the start, our plan was to see the slabs that we got and then let that dictate the design for the base. In other words, 
not going to try to shoehorn what we get into something that we already have planned. That's smart. So since everybody seemed to think that was a good idea, we got to work. And actually, I have a question for you guys. And that is, a lot of woodworking can be pretty repetitive. So my question is, what level of detail do you guys like seeing? For example, here Sean is making the panels for our base. And this is something that we do in a lot of videos. And that's because probably about 90% of the projects that we build involve making a panel at some point. So do you prefer hearing more about the technical aspects of it every time? Or just watching us do it in a more passive, maybe more enjoyable way? On one hand, I can see where explaining it could be the way to go because it's not like everybody watching these videos has seen every other video that we've made or even any other video that we've made. But then on the other hand, I could see how it might get annoying for long-term viewers. Actually, to try to fix that problem, we even made a perfect panel tips video that's about 15 minutes long and goes into way more detail than we ever would in one of these project videos. But I don't know, maybe we're fixing a problem that doesn't actually exist. So let me know what you think. And actually, here's a really good example of how woodworking is repetitive. So while Sean was making the panels, I started making the stretcher. And we each filmed ourselves independently. And you'll notice, or at least I'm noticing while editing this, that a lot of the shots that we got are remarkably similar. Seriously, after this section, go back and watch the panel section again. So I guess maybe another fix to this could be making better use of the chapter features here on YouTube. That way for the long-term viewers, if they feel like skipping around, they can do it a little bit more easily. All that said, at the end of the day, I just want to make good videos, so any input that you guys have is appreciated. All right, so at this point, we've got our panels and we've got our stretcher. And now we're cutting back to Sean, and what he's doing here is cutting an 85 degree angle on the top and bottom edges of the panels. And the reason that he's doing that is because we want the base to have this splay detail rather than being perfectly vertical. So looking at it in a 2D drawing, it's pretty easy to see, but as you start looking in 3D, and once it's in real life in somebody's dining room with chairs around it, I'm honestly not even very sure that you're gonna notice it at all. So we really went back and forth on whether or not it was worth doing. Doing it definitely made things more complicated, but we both agreed that we liked it a little bit better. Obviously it's hard to quantify, but I'd say it made building this portion and a lot of the assembly to come maybe 34% harder and we liked it maybe 8% more. So normally numbers like that would say pick the easy path. But I don't know, it just didn't sit well with either of us so we went with the harder path. And honestly that's kind of been something that we've both done since the beginning. My philosophy with building has always been build the thing that you're most excited about because that's what's going to keep you the most motivated. And if you're motivated you'll work harder, and if you work harder, you'll get better. So in a sort of roundabout way, building hard things is easier because the future version of yourself who decided to build those harder things is better than the future version of yourself who decided to build the easy things. All right, I might have even confused myself there. But hopefully you get the sentiment of what I was trying to say. Also, if you're lucky enough to be able to, just build things that make you the most happy. And even if you mess up a little bit, at least for me personally, I'd rather have a slightly flawed version of something that I love than an immaculate version of something I'm indifferent towards. All that said, what you've been watching me do here is cut a matching angle onto the end of the stretcher so that it matches the panels, and when we assemble everything, it comes together nice without any gaps. I mentioned at the top of the video that this piece was gonna be for sale, which is kind of backwards from how I would normally do things and how most people would probably do things. Obviously the more normal path would be to wait for somebody to order something and then build it for them and not spend thousands on materials and 80 hours of your time on spec hoping that somebody might want it. And one of the reasons that I'm able to do that is because of the support that I get from my Patreon members. So I want to quickly thank all of you for making this possible. And I know that I say it in almost every video, but I truly do mean it. So thank you for everything that you've given me over the years. And for anybody interested in joining, getting a 4 Eyes t-shirt and even discounts on our woodworking plans, check out the link in the description to see if it's right for you. And as always, no pressure. At this point, we were ready to start assembling the base. And because we wanted everything to be able to come apart, 
we used some hardware instead of joinery for this. So initially we thought we might use these brass screws with these brass countersunk washers, which looked really nice and high end. The problem was, I don't consider myself a particularly strong guy. I mean, I work out a little. And I was a semifinalist in the 2018 California State Arm Wrestling Championships for the 70 to 80 kilogram right-handed class. But I bent these things a little too easily. So while they're not as pretty, we decided to go with these bolts instead. And all joking aside, even though I knew there was no way I was going to be able to bend these, I still legitimately gave it a shot. And with confidence high, we decided to proceed. So here we're marking everything out on our panels and then using this portable drill press to drill in two pilot holes in each panel. And this part's going to get kind of technical, so I'm going to cut to an animation that I think will explain things a little bit better. So basically, we need to attach our stretcher and leg panels together. So what we came up with was a pair of threaded inserts into each end of the stretcher, which allows us to use two bolts and washers through the panel into the threaded inserts that'll hold it all together. That means that we needed to create these recesses for the bolts in the panels, and all of that's going to get covered up with a brass plate. So like I mentioned a minute ago, it was important to us that this table be able to come apart. And there were a few reasons for that. One was that altogether, I would guess this table weighs about 350 pounds and it's about 10 and a half feet long and oddly shaped. So it's just kind of hard to move around as one big piece. Next would be that since we don't know what house or building this thing's gonna eventually live in, it could be hard or potentially even impossible to fit through a lot of doorways or into elevators without being unassembled. And on that same front, since we don't know where in the world it's going to go, there's a good chance that it's going to need to be shipped. And the cost difference between shipping it unassembled versus assembled is literally hundreds and possibly even thousands of dollars. Now, this might be a weird thing to say, and I don't want to speak for Sean, but the assembly portions of this table might be the parts that I'm most proud of. And that's not because they were the hardest parts or the best parts but probably because they're the parts that are the most foreign to what we typically do. With the furniture we normally build, the pieces are quite a bit smaller, and for the most part, it's all wooden joinery. With this one, though, we were hoping that we could find some really strong and good-looking hardware to make this easier, but when we couldn't find anything, we had to pivot, and I think in the end, rather than being a compromise, this brass plate is actually going to be a really nice detail. All that said, if you do know of a place where you can find really good looking high end, but also really robust metal fasteners, definitely let me know in the comments because I don't want to have to rely on looking out every time. So with all of the mortises for the hardware cut and the threaded inserts installed, we could do our first assembly of the base. So this was kind of a moment of truth and it took a little fine tuning, but it went together relatively easily and that was a huge moment of relief for us. And it was also a real turning point in the project because now we were finally able to figure out exactly how we wanted to position our slabs and then put the base on top of them and see it all together for the first time. So after we figured out all the positioning with it flipped upside down, we decided to set it up right side up so that we could get our first real look at the table. All right, at this point, the table's starting to take shape and we're getting our first real glimpse of what it's going to look like. Now, normally this is something that Sean and I can do ourselves, and that is creating somewhat realistic renders of our furniture. And if you're familiar with pretty much any of our older projects, you've probably seen that multiple times. For this one though, we wanted to try to get some really good photo realistic renders of the piece, and Fiverr gave us a great opportunity to do that. Now, if you've never heard of Fiverr, basically they connect people like me or you with freelancers who offer all sorts of digital services. Things like video editing, website creation, and in our case, photorealistic furniture renderings. So what I did was reach out to three different designers with the exact same information. I sent them a SketchUp of our model, this picture that explains the grain orientation, a picture of each of the slabs, and this picture that shows an example of what the finish on our base should look like. And honestly, it was pretty simple to type in a couple of key terms see examples of the freelancer's past work and connect with them to explain our project. All right, so I have not seen the results yet, but we got them back, so let's start taking a look. So this is the first one that we got, the most least expensive, the most least expensive? 
I mean, I, technically, I think that's correct. But <laughs> so they sent us four renderings. Nice. Gut reaction to seeing this, Sean. The main thing that stood out to me is how good the slabs look. Yeah, I actually like this one yeah. of these the most. I yeah. like the one with the gray. Let's look at all of them and okay. then kind of go back yeah, and, yeah. and talk about everything. So this is the middle one that we got in a very modern house. I mean, I like seeing it in an, an environment, environment that um, helps the least most expensive one. It would be the least, least expensive. <laughs> yeah, Either way, least, let's, let's just look at the render. This is the most expensive. This one looks really good. It just looks real. Yeah, look, you, I mean, if you look close, you can see there's some of that figuring, you can see the cracks. They picked a very unique and specific environment, but it, it works very well. I, I think that all three of these provide a different sort of value, but I can see something like this or the second one, you could make a pretty strong case for rolling something like this into the price of working with a client yeah. and helping to make sure that you convert the sale. I also think that with a project like this, where there's a lot of unknowns in the way that it's gonna come out, helping to possibly avoid doing something that then you're not quite happy about. My gut reaction looking at this, the circle glass detail, while I think it's cool from like a utility point of view, now I'm skewing towards not wanting to do the circle inlay and that's worth the price of admission for me alone. Mm -hmm. You could straight up just say, not buying the glass, but then also it's invaluable, the not doing something that you might've regretted. In a piece of this scale and, and this size, the amount of money you're spending on materials for something like this, the amount of time you're putting into it, this is wildly useful and valuable to us and to the client. Ultimately, this table isn't for us, it's gonna be for right. somebody else and now, we can create the table without the glass, which right. we can add later if the person really likes that. And we can show the person who buys this table, here's what it looks like with right. that glass insert. Do you like that? And if they say, yes, I really love that, we say, great, and right. we that, can I do mean, it. And now they know what that looks like. It's not just an idea. Right. In the comments, put which one you think you either liked the most or you thought would provide the most value to you as a builder who would be building it for a potential client, or if you were coming at it from the perspective of a client, which one would you find most valuable? Okay, let me say thank you to all of the designers for their work on these renders. And thanks Fiverr for giving us this opportunity. You can head over to fiverr.co slash chrissalimony to check out the services that are available to you and get 10% off with the code four eyes. And I'll throw a link in the description. In this shot, we're marking out where we're gonna cut the ends of our slabs. And our goal here was to leave them as long as we possibly could. So we made our line go from one corner and then follow the angle of the base panel. Then in order to make the cut, we used our track saw, which was just not quite able to make it all the way through. So we could finish off the cut with a handsaw and we can clean things up later. With that done, we could take the base back apart and start adding a few details. So way back whenever I ripped the stretcher to its final width, I kept this off cut and planed it really nice and thin, thinking that it would be great for marking out an arch on the top side of our stretcher. And in this shot, that's exactly what I'm using it to do. And originally my plan was to take that over to the bandsaw and cut out the bulk of it, and then just sand to the line. But after I marked it out, I wasn't really happy with the curve. So instead I made myself a quick little template out of some MDF that I did like the curve of. And while it wasn't as long as the entire curve, I could just move it around a few times while making the cut. And I think this gave me a nicer, more consistent curve. While I was doing that, Sean had the panels and it was using almost the exact same workflow to cut a semicircle on the top edge of each of the panels. And the purpose of these is so that when everything is assembled, there won't be anything directly beneath the slabs when you're looking at it from the top where the gap is. So you'll still see the semicircles beneath the slabs, but we're hoping that this will make for a nice detail from above. To attach our base and our slabs together, we're making some attachment plates out of six inch square chunks of quarter inch thick aluminum. And we started out by marking where we wanted the holes in the plates and then drilling out some pilot holes. So with one of the plates drilled, we could transfer the marks onto the other five plates and then work our way through a bunch of bits to slowly enlarge the holes to be as big as we needed them, as well as countersink the two holes at the center of the plate. Now, the goal here is to make these plates as identical as possible, but 
since we're humans and not CNCs, there's definitely going to be some differences. So that means that moving forward, we're going to have to keep track of where and in what orientation each plate goes on the table. So basically, they're not identical, interchangeable plates. By this point in the project, I had already started working on editing the beginning of the video. You know, the stuff that you watched like 20 minutes ago. So you're going to see a lot more of Sean than me in the next shots. And I have to admit that I was pretty happy about that because this part became pretty repetitive and tedious. Basically, we had to install all of the mounting plates that we just made, which meant drilling and installing 12 threaded inserts into the leg panels so that we could attach the six plates to those, then drilling and installing 24 more into the underside of the table. So I stuck around for the bulk of it to help make things go faster. But unfortunately for Sean, when it came to the worst part of this process, it was pretty much a one-man job and he drew the short stick. I guess it depends on whether you prefer video editing or using a router to recess aluminum plates in the underside of slabs. At this point, the shape of the table is pretty much locked in and we could get to the most important step, finishing. And we ran into some hiccups. For the tops, we worked our way through the grits up to 180, making sure to water pop the grain between coats and fixed any of the cracks that were too small for epoxy with some CA glue. For the base, we sanded up to the same grit and there for finish, we sprayed on black polyurethane. And this is a finish that we've used tons of times. We've wiped it on, sprayed it on, and never had an issue. So it might be hard to tell in these shots, but basically it had the look that you get when you try to use walnut stain to make a wood that isn't walnut look like walnut, which is a look that I'm not a fan of. And generally speaking, I don't really like staining anything other than black, which is why if you look at our channel, I don't think you'll find any videos of us using any stain other than this. But anyway, I don't know if we were in denial or what, but we decided to keep trudging along, sanding between coats, and finally, at this point, we decided that something just wasn't right. So I ended up stirring the can for about 30 minutes, and granted, we had stirred prior to doing anything, but here we really stirred. And lo and behold, a perfect black stain. So hopefully you can see the difference in these shots. In real life, it's pretty drastic. And this was a huge relief because obviously it sucks to mess up on any project, but having something go this wrong this late in the game is heartbreaking. Moving back over to the tops, we did one last pass with 180 grit to make sure that we had the best possible surface for finishing. And then since this was our first time using Rubio Mono Coat, we used the bottom as a learning experience. And it all seemed easy enough, so we flipped things over and did the top. Now, we wanted to use mineral spirits to remove all of the dust from the tops prior to finishing, but since mineral spirits are illegal in California, we decided to use cocaine-laced rags instead. But anyway, then we got our first coat on the top, and honestly, it was a pretty simple finish to apply. Actually, maybe some of you will have some thoughts on this. So I can see how this finish is great for large flat surfaces, but do people use it on things like dressers? To me, it seems like it would be kind of a pain to apply to anything that isn't large, flat, and facing the sky. Also, you might be wondering why we're applying in such small sections, and it's just because of filming. So at this point, we had to wait a couple days before we could apply a second coat, but I was fine with that because now we could finally get the table put together and see it for the first time with all the details and everything looking good. Now, while we were building this table, we got a lot of side-eye glances from people when they found out how we were treating the middle of the table. And I'm sure we're gonna get a lot of comments about this too. And the reason that we're leaving it open isn't because there was any lack of ideas. Obviously, you already saw the glass circle idea. We also could have filled it in with epoxy, done a traditional river table, 
or even just a straight piece of glass down the center. So here's why we didn't. After seeing the renders, the glass really did make me think about a giant version of one of those elevated dog bowl holder things. And personally speaking, I think leaving the center open looks really good. But I get that that might not work for some people. And like I mentioned way back at the beginning of this video, this table is for sale. So I think the best solution is to find the buyer and then work with them to do whatever center treatment they want. Or if it works for them like this, leave it as is. And really, that's the bottom line and the most important thing. This table is for somebody else to have and to live with. And that doesn't mean that I can't have my opinion and you can't have your opinion, but I think that by far the most important opinion is going to be their opinion. All of that said, thank you for watching, and thank you again to all of the Fiverr creators for their renders. And if you want to try out their services, head to fiverr.co slash chrissalimony, and make sure to use the code 4 to get 10% off. Alright, we'll see you in the next one.